This is the Sony Xperia 1 IV, specifically made with creators like photographers, videographers, and musicians in mind. It's made by Sony, the only smartphone company that makes real cameras, and they built a real shutter in there for us. Look at how it focuses when I half press and then takes the picture. We're gonna compare it against the two flagships from the other big smartphone manufacturers, the Samsung Galaxy S22 Ultra, and of course, the iPhone 13 Pro Max. It has a pro mode with totally manual controls, even 30 second exposures if that's what you want. So it really unlocks a lot of creativity that smartphones like the iPhone hide away under computational photography. It gives me that control that a photographer wants. Okay, enough talk. Let's go take some pictures with it and see how it does. We're in Devil's Hop Yard State Park and there's an osprey in that tree over there. So I'm gonna test out all the telephoto lenses and maybe we'll get to see it try to catch a fish. Apple's really lacking behind in the telephoto lenses and Samsung is clearly winning. I love how on the Sony I can use the volume buttons to zoom in and out. That lets me keep my hands in this position holding the camera really steady. And then when I'm ready, I can just snap a picture with the shutter button, like a real physical shutter button. Oh, it's diving straight out. And you can see what the 20 frames per second provides you. It's the ability to catch that split second moment. Does this compare to my $20,000 Sony wildlife rig? No, but there's enough to see that the Osprey didn't catch a fish and won't be eating, at least not right now. I'm taking pictures of these tiny little flowers to see the macro capabilities of the camera. And it looks like the widest lens is letting me do that at 0.7 times zoom. So I'm trying to focus on these little things and then I'm also adjusting the exposure to make sure that they're properly exposed. They're so small and bright. The wind moved the flowers too much, so we repeated the test at home. In the upper left, the Sony just couldn't get close at all. The Samsung here got very close and exposed the flower beautifully. The iPhone didn't expose it as well, but actually got the closest with the ultra wide lens. So for macro, it's a narrow win for the iPhone, but a pretty big loss for the Sony. I'm just testing out the brightness of the screens right now because when you're taking photos in full sun like today, sometimes it can make the screen unusable. It can be difficult to see. All of them look pretty good. They're all bright. The Samsung is definitely the brightest, but they're all usable and look good. Now I'll test the wide and ultra wide angle lenses with this bridge here. I'm also going to be shooting in raw so we can see if we can pull up some of those shadows. Comparing the ultra wide lenses, we can see the iPhone is a little bit wider than the Sony. Let's zoom in. The iPhone here is way over sharpened. Like look at the way all of these edges glow. The Sony clearly looks better. Here's the normal wide lenses. We can see the processing on the Sony is again more natural while the iPhone is oversaturated. Here, I think it's about a tie, though the iPhone seems to have more detail because it's over sharpened. Comparing their telephoto lenses, the color and processing seems about identical. Let's zoom in. Here I see just a little bit more in detail out of the iPhone when you don't have to crop. Now comparing the Samsung to the Sony, we can see the Samsung is significantly wider than the Sony, but the Sony offers substantially more detail. The normal wide lenses, it's gonna to be tough for the Sony because the Samsung has a 100 megapixel mode. Let's check out the details. Wow, way more detail from the 12 megapixel Sony than the 100 megapixel Samsung. How is this possible? Well, the 100 megapixels is mostly fake. It generates a huge file, but it doesn't show you more detail, and that's the reason it's not turned on by default. It's bogus. For normal day-to-day -day shooting like this, the Sony produced the best images. Hey, our Osprey came back to show off the fish he caught. I didn't bother trying the iPhone sad telephoto lens, but check out the detail from the Samsung. This is like National Geographic stuff. Up next, I took some portraits of Chelsea under the bridge. Each smartphone has a portrait mode where it generates fake bokeh, simulating a big fat lens on a mirrorless camera. Let's check out the results. Compared to the iPhone, the more telephoto lens on the Sony was a big advantage. Also, I hate the way the iPhone renders faces, like it just made her face kind of orange and brightened her eyes up too much. It just looks unnatural. Speaking of unnatural, let's zoom in and check out the fake bokeh. Okay, windy day with lots of stray hairs is playing on hard mode for both cameras, but well, they're both pretty bad in this case. Maybe the iPhone is a little bit smoother. 
However, I like that the iPhone recovered some of the background. In different lighting, we see the same thing. The iPhone overprocesses the face, but recovers the background more. But here, the Sony actually did a better job of blending in the bokeh. The Samsung's portrait mode isn't nearly as tight as the Sony. The Sony is definitely better for things like headshots. Like the other two smartphones, the Samsung really struggled with the bokeh transitions. All right, we're gonna take the Sony phone to the waterfall and we're going to take long exposures because the shutter speed can go as slow as 30 seconds but we're going to have to do a lot of voiceover because it's extremely loud there. So let's go. Even though we have big traditional cameras that we would normally use for something like this, it's so powerful to know you can use your smartphone, which fits in your pocket, making it easy to hike with. And if it slips in the water, they're totally waterproof. The iPhone was the easiest to use because MagSafe allowed me to attach it to the tripod magnetically with no clamps that often block the buttons. Attaching the ND filter to the Xperia was really hard because of the odd shape of the lens. Hopefully somebody makes filters specifically for the Xperia soon. I loved using manual mode on the Xperia to dial in the perfect settings, but notice that the user interface doesn't rotate vertically. It's like Sony thinks nobody takes vertical pictures. The Xperia will use infrared focusing. In other words, it transmits infrared and that was bouncing off the filter, which got kind of ugly here. It's less visible here, but it still added a bit of a purple tinge to these rocks. This shot was overexposed, but I can actually bring that down because I was shooting raw. The Xperia's raw file gave me about a stop and a half of highlight recovery. Zooming in, we see it's capable of a real proper long exposure. Photographers can use the iPhone's live photo feature to make it a long exposure. It's not perfect. You can see some repeating patterns here, but overall it does a pretty good job. Like the Xperia, the Samsung's RAW files allow you to recover about a stop and a half of blown out highlights. I love that I can do these long exposures with smartphones now. To test the front facing cameras, we took a selfie near the waterfall. The iPhone and the Samsung both performed heavy processing on the faces to lift the shadows up and that does make the eyes pop more. The Sony's is more neutral. Notice that the Samsung selfie camera is very crowded. It just isn't as wide angle and I prefer those from the Sony and the iPhone. Zooming in on Chelsea's face shows just how much the iPhone raises the shadows. After sunset, I put all the cameras on a tripod and took the best night exposures I could. The Sony's manual mode was extremely useful. I used it to manually focus on the stars and set the longest 30 second exposure with a manual ISO. Here's the images after editing. Let's zoom in on the stars. You can see the image from the Sony is cleaner than the iPhone. The stars are shown more clearly too. The iPhone has ugly artifacts like this that the Sony renders much better. The two smartphones shot this image fundamentally different. The Sony did a proper 30 second exposure like a traditional camera while the iPhone used computational photography and that computational photography introduced some flaws, especially on this windy night. Look how the iPhone rendered this tree that was moving in the wind. It looks weird. The Sony rendered it more naturally. The Sony beat the night mode on the S22 Ultra by even more. This is the same section of sky, but the Sony shows far more stars. And the Samsung has a lot of ugly over sharpening artifacts. This was a big win for the Sony. Okay, so let's summarize those results. The Sony camera has amazing clear advantages. It's got the sharpest photos in portraits and its zoom lens up to 125 millimeters was the sharpest. So if you're looking to take photos relatively far away, this is the winner. But if you get into wildlife photography, birds, astrophotography, things like the moon, the Samsung's telephoto lens is absolutely amazing. That cannot match this 200 millimeters for extremely far things. But up to 125 millimeters, the Sony was better than either of these two phones in just about every condition. Yeah, and I also wanna say I, I really appreciate the processing on the Sony because I often think that they way over bake the iPhone photos. They do too much HDR for me. It makes the skin look unnatural. This looks more like what I see when I take a photo with my camera. And I know I'm gonna be pulling everything into post-process anyway before I share. So I prefer the results of this. And I love that it had manual controls built right into the camera. Camera. The Samsung has that too, but the iPhone, you have to open up another app and it's just kind of clumsy. And as a result, I never end up using it. The physical shutter button on that too, I found myself really liking to use it as well as being able to zoom with the volume button. So overall for creators, for people taking stills and video, I think that's the best camera I've used. Especially for Sony shooters, because it's similar to using a Sony camera. You half press down the button and you see the autofocus box come up and it feels more familiar and natural. Whereas sometimes I feel like something like the iPhone is trying to do, it's trying to think too much for me and I don't want it to. I want to do my old familiar habits. 
I think another thing that professionals and enthusiasts will appreciate about the Sony is that it has a headphone jack. So if you want to monitor sound while you're taking video, you can do that. Or if you're a gamer, you can use the headphone jack. It's got a micro SD card. So if you want an SD card, you have that option here. Uh, it has a 4K screen and it's $1,600. Pretty pricey. Yeah, but all these are pricey. We're professional photographers and YouTubers, and if you want to learn that, you should check out our book, Stunning Digital Photography, at northrop.photo. We have a sale going on now. Also, subscribe to our channel. Tons of reviews and tutorials. All the stuff creators need. Yeah, we do the artsy stuff. We talk about composition. We do the science nerdy stuff. We do photo news. So if you're interested in photography, check us out. I don't think we're going to disappoint you. Bye. I should not have trusted obstacle avoidance.